Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name's Alex Roberts, and I'm part of the OECD's Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Uh, we hope that uh, all of you and yours are safe and well at the moment in these uh, strange and difficult times. We've got a jam-packed event for you today, uh, which I hope you will all find very interesting, but there's a few housekeeping things first uh, to deal with. Um, oh, sorry. Still getting the hang of this. Firstly, I'd like to recognise the, the help of the uh, European Union um, and their Horizon 2020 programme, under which this webinar and a bunch of other work that we're doing at the observatory are being funded. Um, secondly, just a couple of housekeeping matters. I'd like to note that this webinar is being recorded and we will be making it available on our YouTube account. Uh, we'll let you know when this happens. We certainly encourage questions today, and if you have any, please add them into the chat box. We'll try to get to as many as possible today, but I suspect there, there might be quite a lot. So if we don't, we'll try to follow up after. Um, and there's a hashtag if you uh, wish to tweet. Um, I'd now like to pass over to Edwin Lau, uh, Senior Counselor in the Public Governance Directorate of the OECD to give us a few opening remarks. Edwin. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of the OECD. And uh, I think we're seeing that one of the really fantastic things about going virtual is that we have incredible participation from all around the world. And uh, I think as much as we all like to stop by Paris once in a while, uh, what's most important is the ideas. And so we're glad that you can join us for this uh, webinar on innovation and the response to COVID-19. Uh, so I think no one can disagree right now that we need more innovative and more agile government. But I think the thing we wanted to underline is that innovation is not anything goes. In fact, there's now more of a need than ever to have a deliberate, mission-oriented, systemic approach to innovation, which allows us to really get at the heart of the problems that we're trying to address. Um, and so for that reason, it's I'm really pleased that we have this panel of practitioners that are going to give us sort of the, the coal face view of uh, how innovation systems are responding to COVID-19. So before we dive into the content, uh, I just wanted to mention to you that uh, the, the work of the OPSI is fitting into a, a broader set of work in our public governance directorate, where we're looking at issues around digital, around innovation, around um, integrity, uh, around regulatory responses. And so this is, part of uh, what I mean by taking the systemic approach. So what we've seen is that the COVID-19 crisis shows that public governance matters. It underscores the need uh, to have screens that work and don't blank out. <laughs> um, it underscores the need for us to really take an approach that looks at the short term, the medium term, and the long term uh, response to uh, COVID-19. And what I mean by that is that in the short term, of course, we need to be quite responsive, but it also means we're looking at whether or not the, the government uh, systems and, and uh, uh, routines that are in place, whether or not those are sufficient to, to able to deal with these types of crises which test uh, the, the, um, the, the, the level of their uh, responsiveness and also um, um, of their, their dependability. It's also an issue of whether or not we have the planning for the, the uh, emergency needs and administrative simplification to allow us to respond quickly uh, when the time is needed, and whether or not we have the intelligence, in particular through the form of government data, to be able to uh, have an understanding of the, the needs uh, of the crisis. In the medium term, this is also thinking about how do we map those processes for the recovery so that we're not just focusing on the here and now, but also uh, how do we get back to normal or some semblance of normal. In part, this is about what are viable ways uh, for our public financial system. Uh, it's engaging stakeholders in uh, the return uh, and the reopening of the economy. It's looking at the transboundary issues and how governments can collaborate. Uh, and then it's also how do we move from this sort of temporary suspension of a lot of the rules and processes in order to be able to respond quickly to uh, either um, restoring the rule of law in most cases, but in some cases also trying to learn uh, from this experience and seeing whether there are lessons that we can 
build into our systems after the crisis. And then finally, in terms of the, the long term, we're thinking about what are those deeper and more structural ways uh, that public administrations can uh, respond after the crisis. In part, this is about um, our ability to respond to future shocks, but it's also you know, what is the vision that our governments have for the public sector of the future uh, and the relationship between that public sector with the economy and with our societies. So the ways in which we're responding to the crisis today, that's laying the seeds uh, for that government of the future. So just some thoughts on uh, the, the issues that we're thinking about, how we're trying to keep this on the, uh, an eye on the horizon. And in terms of how the OECD can help, um, the, the, the Public Governance Committee, which is sort of our governing board, is looking, has asked us to capture the lessons from the pandemic. Uh, and uh, this is feeding into the OECD's coronavirus, tackling coronavirus hub, which includes uh, lessons and policies from all across the house, uh, including the OPSI's innovative response tractor, which so far has more than 250 innovative cases uh, to help highlight the differing responses uh, by countries in these unusual times. So uh, I look forward to the rest of the conversation and to hearing from all of you. So back to you, Alex. Thanks so much, Edwin. Uh, so as Edwin was talking, you know, a crisis behooves us to learn to, to make sense of and give purpose to the, the losses and the costs that we've all suffered. And part of our role is to help collect and share that learning uh, from across all these different contexts, um, because this is a true global crisis and everyone has been affected. So we know there's learning going on in every country and every jurisdiction. Now that learning is even more important when we're in an unprecedented situation and we need to learn quickly, because it literally can be a matter of life and death, and it can be significant to our economies, to our societies and to everyone's life. Um, so today we're going to share some of what we've seen and hear from some expert practitioners. Uh, sorry, still getting the hang of this. Um, today we've got with us uh, Lene Kro Jefferson from the Danish National Centre for Public Sector Innovation. Hi Lene. Uh, we have Pierre Schoenrad from the South African Centre for Public Service Innovation. Thank you Pierre and Bruno Montero from LabEx in the Portuguese uh, government. We're going to explore what this crisis is revealing about innovation in and by the public sector. Uh, but it might be helpful just to give you a quick uh, spiel about us at OPSI uh, for those who might not be familiar with us. So what, what does the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation do? Well, we look at uncovering what is next looking at emerging trends in public sector innovation. We have a trends report that has come out in the past three years. And we have some innovation primers, for instance, such as uh, one on artificial intelligence that came out in November last year. We look at how to turn the new into the normal and help embed the promising practices. Uh, we have things such as a, a toolkit navigator to assist with that. And we look to provide governments with trusted advice around how to take a more deliberate approach and a consistent approach to public sector innovation. So what have we uh, been doing? Well, nearly seven weeks ago, we issued a call to start tracking innovative responses uh, with the help of the Center for Public Impact and GovInsider. We've collected over 250 examples of varying scope and varying degrees of innovativeness. We've seen quite a diverse mix of activity uh, in those uh, cases. We've seen things such as structural responses and possible longer term shifts, such as, um, for instance, only this week, a couple of the airlines have started, a couple of the rescue packages for some national airlines have included climate change uh, ambitions in that as part of the conditionality. We've seen things such as solidarity platforms, uh, why, by, um, whether government or non-government actors trying to make it easier for people to volunteer and to support their neighbours and their communities. Uh, we've seen a range of hackathons um, uh, all over Europe, I, I think, there's, there's been some, including a, a pan-European one run by the European, European Commission, uh, looking at novel ideas. I think uh, uh, and, uh, one example was from Lithuania, where they 
uh, implemented some of those quite quickly. So um, there have also been other challenges to, to, uh, from governments to develop novel responses in a quick sort of way. There's been a lot around service delivery in a crisis and adjusting to, to the context. So we've seen a lot around digital transformation. Uh, I think one of my favorite examples has been uh, a couple of jurisdictions where uh, virtual weddings and, and distant wedding registrations have been issued, which really shows you the, the magnitude of this crisis when something so human and so social can now be done digitally. Um, there have been adaptive responses by legislatures as they try and make sure they continue their role in scrutinizing the executive um, and meeting in, in a virtual sense. There have been all sorts of infection control measures and tracking measures, and, uh, such as a range of apps that are being developed in different jurisdictions. There's been the leveraging and redeploying of existing resources and, and available capacities. For instance, in Sweden, uh, when a number of the air, for, the air uh, stewards with the SAS airline were stood down, um, they were encouraged to take up uh, health training to support the health network and the hospital provision, uh, hospitals. There's certainly been a lot of work around improving communications and providing targeted information. And um, there's, uh, there've also been quite a few interesting cases, I think, around thinking about what this crisis means for, for children, our some of our most vulnerable and anxious in this time. For instance, New Zealand uh, issued a special declaration that the Easter Bunny was considered an essential worker so that it could continue to deliver during uh, the lockdown measures. There's the Portugal's COVID for Kids platform, which has done, I think, a great job in trying to make sense of this. Uh, there's also been some imaginative things. Uh, this case from a school in China where they asked the students to build distance hats, one metre hats, so that they could comprehend and understand what uh, maintaining social distance means, which I think is a really ingenious sort of way and a, a great way of making a, a very difficult situation, um, you know, actionable and uh, for, for kids. Of course, it's hard to say um, over all of this, we've collected a lot of cases, but we know we certainly haven't caught all of them. Uh, people have not surprisingly been rather busy doing rather than perhaps recording what they are doing at the moment. And of course, it's, all, it's rather hard to say whether all of these are good or, or not so good innovations, um, because we'll really only be able to tell that over time. And some innovations will be easier to see at, at the time they're done, and others may not become obvious for a while until we, we sort of uh, think through that. Um, so what I'd like to ask our panelists now is to get a richer picture of what's going on. Um, this has been a, a truly global crisis, as I mentioned. So Bruno, can you tell me perhaps a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of innovative responses uh, in Portugal? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I hope that you are safe and sound with your families and friends all across the globe. Um, I will to I will try to keep short. So if you can if you could if you could present my my slide, it will be very helpful. So um, in Portugal, uh, we are we are facing a very specific um, um, need to to in with regard to this to this crisis. And I start saying this truism because I I don't want to appear as um, patronizing because all the responses are of course very context uh, sensitive <clears throat> and what I what I will try to do is to share uh, our own uh, stake in in answering um, the form that this specific crisis um, that of course has very resemblances across the globe but the specific format that it takes in Portugal from a very narrow uh, point of view that is my own, my own as practitioner. In, in Portugal, I will, I will probably highlight um, this threefold innovation approach. So th there are three ways where I think we can summarize the answers that in, in Portugal are, are taking place in, with regard to this crisis. That, of course, uh, is just a very it, it, demonstrative um, exercise because I strongly recommend you that to go to the Innovative Response Tracker 
where you can take a, a look, a broad look about the, the, the Portuguese uh, initiatives. So if you look at the way we are answering the crisis in Portugal, you can, you can think in answers and responses that are taking place uh, from inside out. That is, the, the state tries to answer the demand, the new demands that are being uh, put over him. And uh, we, we would like to, to answer to, 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 this, to this challenge from Alex presenting, we are on. It's, a, it's a, a single point of contact. In fact, it's a huge hub that works as a portal where people could, could not only access to very reliable and up-to-date information about legal initiatives, about the workings of the public services, but they can also get an, a direct access to do digital services that are being provided by the portal ePortugal. So people have this very um, easy point of contact with the all uh, things that are being um, changing in the state and they are changing um, sometimes in a very fast pace. So this is a very uh, reliable point of contact and it is important not only for citizens but also for companies because here they can um, access directly to all the, the, the package of uh, support programs that are being developed. So we have this very uh, condensed uh, point of entry to the vast array of solutions that are being proposed. And that is important to counteract not only the fact there are a lot of misinformation going on, but also the problems that we always uh, face when we deal with very, um, polarized, uh, um, a very polarized offer of, of services. Then we can also see that the civil society itself has organized to provide answers and to challenge the state to, uh, or to help the state to provide answers. So we can look from outside in. And in this case, I would like to, to highlight the, um, this platform. It's called Tech for COVID-19. It's a huge um, community of practices with more than 5,000 professionals. And they are working in a very collaborative fashion to provide solutions such as um, a video uh, channel to do uh, consultations online for free or to provide um, an app uh, that, that, that could do that from, from, from any place or um, a platform to help local commerce to sell online because you know that um, there's uh, some, some, some difficulties for the smallest uh, entrepreneurs to access sometimes the digital channels and this huge community helped them to, to provide that kind of answer. So the civil society has helped to providing uh, answers and also to challenge the, the state in, uh, in, in a good way. And finally, the state itself within, let's say, uh, has provided some very um, pr promising initiatives. So we have this collaborative work plan for public administration. It was a, a very collaborative uh, work that set up 22 projects uh, held by 27 uh, public entities and civil society organizations that work together to provide a guide for leadership in times of crisis, uh, to help to uh, promote the innovation through, for instance, the innovation barometer, or to disseminate um, information strategies that help uh, the entities to contact more directly and more easily with the, with the citizens. And at the same time, it, uh, it takes the crisis as the, um, the trigger to um, embody this philosophy of collaboration as an innovation of the public administration through very um, tangible results that, that, that were these 22 projects. So it was um, a kind of occasion to accelerate the delivery of the state and to help the public entities to have a coordinated effort in answering the, the new challenges being placed by this crisis. So trying to summarize, uh, we really think that the innovation is taking place in very different levels in, in, in Portugal. We have highlighted these three cases, but please feel free to take a look on the OPSI's Innovative Responsive Tracker because it's a very good way of getting um, deeper, deeper dive in, uh, in, other, in other interesting cases. You, you are turning, you, you should turn on your, your phone. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, I'm gonna to turn to you now, Lene, to share a little about what you've seen um, from your network. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to see, I'm going to try to share it from my own screen here. Let's see what happens. Here we go. 
Um, thanks for inviting me to share here. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what kind of a National Center for Public Sector Innovation we are. Do feel free to, to look at our website, but we do cover the entire uh, public sector, so across all three levels um, of government. I need this to move on. Here we go. So, I think that in order to answer what to understand the innovative responses to the COVID crisis in Denmark, I, I want to just show you what kind of a crisis it is, it is that we responded to. Uh, it has been so far somewhat mild. Uh, we're very thankful for that. We've had 9,938 confirmed cases uh, with the test capacity rapidly expanding over the past weeks and, and in the weeks to come. I just heard this morning they're going to now do uh, randomly select uh, 2,400 citizens and have them tested just to get a more accurate um, understanding, scientifically accurate understanding of, of how, how many uh, we should expect to be actually hit by COVID in society. Every death is, of course, a tragedy. We've had 503 corona-related confirmed deaths. Yesterday, we had 228 hospitalized with corona, and of those, uh, 49 were in the ICU, and of those, 39 on ventilators. We've seen a faster flattening of the curve than expected. Uh, it's not even close to even the most optimistic um, uh, scenarios from the health authorities. Just to give a, just one indicator on the financial situation as well, I've chosen to show the unemployment rate, which has risen from 4.7% uh, in early uh, March to 6.3% in late April. I've also shown you a uh, map of Denmark, and the, the darker the spots are, the higher the level of unemployment, because this is also an indication for social inequality, because we can see that the municipalities that were beforehand struggling with uh, unemployment, social crisis, the um, financial crisis as well, they are being hit harder now. So I think at some point in the future, we need to, to deal with the fact that the COVID uh, crisis uh, has huge social inequalities in it in many different ways. In terms of the specific examples of innovative responses, um, I wanna highlight a few. As I agree with you, Alex, I think we're seeing some things now and over time we'll see something else. So it is very much a, tracking this as a, as a continuous process. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface now in terms of capturing what is happening. The communication and product innovations are easier to spot. We've seen known channels used in different ways. Our prime minister held a couple of press conferences for kids. Uh, the government has used influencers. To, uh, to reach a, a larger and different uh, audience group uh, than would normally get the governmental messages. We've seen lightning fast implementation of technologies such as video consultation with your GP and using a chatbot to quicker answer people's corona related questions. So that's technology that was readily available and was really implemented fast. Um, I think we'll get a better look at the service uh, innovations in the weeks to come and months to come. One example, very much in light of what you said there, Bruno, is that I know one municipality that helped develop a local e-commerce platform for the local shops because they don't have a website where they sell their goods. So this is also in terms of sort of local solutions to, to, to help the local economy. Um, and you could argue that the video consultation and the chatbot is also a service innovation, but things are rarely just one type of innovation. I think in terms of the organizational and process innovations, we're just starting to see now what's been going on. And, and anything related to collaboration is the one that stands out the most clearly. Anything from companies and volunteers that are 3D printing face shields. Um, I really like that, at least for a couple of days, the makers movement in Denmark that self-organized over Facebook, they were actually printing as many face shields as Grundfos, which is one of our major industrial um, um, organizations that that change their production orders to do face shield so I think that's cute and nice um, and another is the health system so in Denmark the health system spans regional levels where simply put are responsible for the hospitals and municipal level which is responsible for at-home care we've been discussing structural reforms and better collaboration and change of of, of collaboration across these sectors for, for years. And we've been discussing a health reform for years. And now we're seeing doctors being like, can we just please, whatever papers you guys have laying around with the health reform, can we scrap them? And can we build it on what's happening right now? Um, so I think we're, we could, maybe we should start talking about this as some proof of concepts and some prototypes for some of the more massive changes that we wanna come. 
And I think these more radical innovations and, and potential that's just starting to come out into the light. And lastly, as somebody told me this week, we've done a quantum leap in digital transformation. And that's from a massively good starting point. In Denmark in 2019, 74% of the population used the internet daily, 93% used mobile banking, 86% have interacted with government through dig digital means in 2019, and 90% use the official digital uh, post. And we pretty much, speaking broadly, have the infrastructure there when we're sent home to work from home in the public sector. And I'd, I'd say that a majority of the public sector employees that work in offices like, like we do, the infrastructure was there. It was a matter of scaling the capacity, uh, very broadly speaking. But this is a, I think this is a major disruption in our digital work habits when we work from home full time for such a long uh, period of time as well. I know of more than one public sector organization that had implemented Teams about a month before lockdown and they were like, what is this and why do we need it? And then the lockdown came and the answer was there. This is when we need Teams. Um, I've previously worked with supporting more virtual ways of working and that was uh, very much an, an uphill struggle and battle. And this time I think we'll actually see a transformation because we've done it for such a long period of time and it's, it's both employees and leaders and citizens that, that have the experiences now. Specifically, if we look towards the digital interactions with, um, with the citizens, the libraries, they are talking about being a library in the cloud and, ch and going even more into digital um, solutions. Uh, we're starting to see, I think, next level digital communication between government and citizens. The digital post in Denmark, it's still, in Danish you say that you put um, electricity to paper because the digital post, it pretty much is the PDF of the letter that you would normally get with the physical post in a lot of the cases. So I think we're seeing the next step now. Uh, you're starting to work, if you need to work uh, with um, in the social sector and social services, you need to do social work through phone, text, platforms like Signal and Teams have been uh, used as well. Signal because young people don't have email, but they still need social services in the time of the COVID crisis. So I've seen examples of this as well. Um, yeah, those are some of the examples for now. Thanks, Lene. Um, now to turn to you, Pierre, uh, in quite a different context. I know um, uh, South Africa hasn't been as directly affected in some ways. So case numbers are, have, of course, still been a, a worry. Uh, what can you tell us about innovation in your context? Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, um, Alex, and good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm trying to share my screen as well, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't really matter because I'll just touch some of the things Bruno and Lena has already um, touched on. Our numbers actually look very similar to Denmark. Um, we have done about 280,000 tests. Uh, we've got 7,808 confirmed uh, positive cases, but we're extremely fortunate to have only 153 um, deaths related to um, to COVID. Um, and there was a lot of pessimism about Africa and what's happening in Africa uh, for quite some time. Uh, and we're very fortunate that those numbers does not um, reflect uh, the pessimism. Um, I'm trying to get my screen share working. Um, but it doesn't allow me at the moment, and it was working a moment ago. Um, however, let me just talk to one or two small issues um, that has not been mentioned or one or two. I think in Africa, what we've seen is that there's a very context specific reaction. I've got a nice picture here, and hopefully if the slides work later on in the conversation, I'll share that of Rwanda. Um, rolling out very rapidly hand washing facilities at public transport hubs, um, Ghana repurposing the zipline drone vaccine deliveries to deliver test kits. Um, in South Africa, we've also seen um, existing screening programs. I think people forget that Africa has got a lot of experience dealing with epidemics and pandemics. So um, programs that are focused on HIV, TB, malaria, Ebola even, 
um, are used. So community health workers are trained and rapidly rolled out to, to assist with screening and with, with um, testing. Um, and repurposing existing capacity is another trend that we've seen. Um, for example, we've got quite a significant TB, uh, tuberculosis burden in the country. And the specific testing machines that were used for tuberculosis that are rolled out to many rural areas have been repurposed to do testing for, uh, for COVID. Uh, then on the social media, I think it's been um, uh, uh, well explained by yourself and by everyone else how that was probably one of the most significant impacts. Um, what I wanted to highlight is something interesting. We had a campaign, a hashtag campaigns, listen to the doctors and listen to the experts. And then the sharing, daily sharing of videos from experts and from doctors. And that was to deal with uh, a lot of the trust issues um, and to trust the citizens with the technical detail behind the decision making. Uh, so the Minister of Health would have regular briefings and bringing on board the technical experts and then also focusing that on kids um, and, and related to um, very specific messages for kids. So these are th some of the things that I want to highlight now. Later in the conversation, I'll talk to, to more of the national system of innovation responses as well. Um, sorry for the share, uh, the screen that doesn't want to share at the moment, but back to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Pierre. Um, yes, technology doesn't always want to collaborate, I'm afraid. Um, well, I think we've seen uh, then that there's been quite the, the surge of innovation and uh, some, as Lene was mentioning, things that were already in track uh, being accelerated or unlocked by this. Um, that fits with some of our previous research at the observatory, where we've been thinking about um, that there are four key things that we think are really important in influencing the extent to which innovative activity occurs. And I think a crisis really helps demonstrate these and, and highlight these. Um, where the fact that we're seeing all of this in innovation suggests that a crisis is indeed being conducive for innovation. And that doesn't always mean that the innovation is easier. For instance, um, you know, we talk about there need, being a need for clarity. Is there an overriding message that change is necessary? Well, in this crisis, innovation is clearly needed. Um, we talk about the parity, whether new options are given equal footing with existing solutions in decision making. At the moment, the bias towards existing options is gone because we can see that existing options were inadequate or insufficient for the context we're in. We talk about suitability, that whether the new ways of working and thinking are being invested in and supported and used. Well, at the moment, there are a whole range of different capabilities that are being supported and invested in sometimes at scale and at a great pace. And there's also what we call a normality, whether people expect government to be trying new things and recognizing that not all of them all work. Well, at the moment, doing something unusual seems perfectly normal. Um, in fact, to be weird if you were doing what was previously normal um, and probably against several laws in a lot of countries. Um, so I think there's an interesting question to explore about how a crisis has made innovation easier or whatnot. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to throw open a, a poll, uh, which we'll uh, have up while, uh, while uh, I turn to the next uh, question for our panelists. Um, Lena, it can be hard to innovate at the best of times. Is it actually easier to innovate when it's far from the best of times, when there's a state of crisis? What have you seen from your network about trying to respond in innovative ways at the moment? How has the crisis helped and or hindered innovative activity? Yeah, um, I'm going to try to, as I wrote in the chat, I've, um, I've unducked my computer, so there's just one screen now. So I'm just going to see if it actually works for sharing the screen now. You're probably seeing the entire presentation now, right? Does it work with the screen sharing this time? I think you need to click again. Oh yeah, there's just a headline there now. Okay. <laughs> 
um, innovation in time of Corona? Because I think I think the answer, Alex, is that some things are easier and some things are harder. Um, so I think in some ways it's been um, it's been easier, and in some ways it's been harder. So the quantum leap I, I mentioned in, in digital transformation that's been way easier. But at the same time, I think I'm seeing that the systems have been in crisis mode, and crisis mode entails a centralization of the decision making at the top of the hierarchy. So at the top of the hierarchy, you're making decision about innovative solutions that are uh, that need to be implemented in the front lines. So it might be a little bit too far away from specific knowledge about context and possibilities. So I think that's that's made it harder, some places for some people. Um, and I maybe and it's it's too early to say, but I do have a hypothesis that that uh, innovation work not related to Corona has that's taken a back burner during at least for the past two months. So the question is also how soon will that would be put back on I don't know on the front burner, <laughs> and are some of these innovation the existing innovation work does that need to change in light of the Corona crisis? Are the problems we understood a couple of months ago, do they look the same now? And how does that change? And how does that influence that work? So I think there's something there that will influence, influence us in a long time as well. I find some hope in that uh, I, I heard this week that this has given an increased legitimacy of public sector innovation. I think something that you guys also mentioned in the beginning in framing this session. I heard this recently, for the municipalities that saw innovation as a luxury, Corona has shown them that innovation is a necessity. Corona has increased the legitimacy of public sector innovation. And this is uh, despite the fact that we know from our innovation barometer that eight out of 10 public sector workplaces have implemented an innovation during 2015 and 16. So I think this could indicate that we see, might see an increased innovation capacity and hopefully more radical innovation on the other emerging crisis that we also have, climate crisis. We're see, we have some demographic issues as well. Lots of older people, not so many young people, lots of kids. We need new answers to that. And, and the financial crisis in whichever shape or form it takes after the corona crisis as well. Some people who haven't worked specifically with innovation approaches have still done it because they needed to do work in massively new ways, but they didn't necessarily have the tools and approaches um, to do it, to know how to do it professionally. So, so I think also as a last point, that this point to if we're going to use this corona crisis as a sort of lever to increase more radical innovation and the innovation capacity in the public sector, we need to have another look at the role of innovation units and innovation um, ecosystems. Um, I spoke to an innovator in the health sector in the early days of the crisis and she told me, our colleagues are more innovative now than they've been for a long time. Initially, we've done our best to get out of the way of the cl clinicians while trying to monitor and get a feeling of the innovation they're creating. Later, we'll need to work more strategically with the innovations that have emerged. So I think also that the parts of the public sector that have a strong innovation capacity, whether it be a formal innovation unit or in some other way, a stronger innovation capacity, they have a better foundation for lifting the innovation capacity to a higher level and enabling innovation that is not needed uh, that is indeed not a, a luxury, but a necessity. And to m make that shift towards the strategic discussions based on everything that's been happening now as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Pierre, turning to you, um, what have you seen about the practice of innovation at the moment? Has it become easier or harder or both? Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm not even going to bother to do with the screen share at the moment. So um, I think the, the word that can summarize, or the two words, is enthusiasm and frustration. And I think it's very similar to what was just said, that um, at individual level, people realize that the only way to deal with the crisis is by innovating. So we see many more people innovating. However, uh, in the same vein as, as was said around decentralizing, uh, there's a lot of frustration because the specialists are closing rank. So there's some form of silofication um, and different sectors not synchronizing. So an innovation that may work in health is not necessarily good for social services or in policing um, may not be good for uh, social well-being. Uh, so the silification has created um, a little smaller crises uh, throughout the system. Um, and then the competency in the use of these 
the more appropriate tools have been problematic, especially at um, at organizational level. Um, what we've also seen, and I think uh, in, in our case, and I think in many developing countries, uh, is that people from the beginning realize what are the limitations um, to uh, that the system is bringing. For example, we immediately understood what's the limitation of the healthcare system. Uh, we understood what is the challenges around the HIV burden and that directed um, people towards innovating and putting the right programs in place. Um, and then um, what I think what we're not looking at sufficiently at the moment um, is the issues of isolation versus the breaking of barriers. Um, the team dynamics in innovation units and innovation teams have changed because of the, um, of the crisis. Um, but at the same time, social innovators stepped up, um, as was mentioned earlier in terms of the maker and the civic tech uh, movements. Um, and breaking barriers that has been extremely difficult in the past to to get through uh, to government departments and so on so you have the the isolation of innovation units but at the same time you have uh, barriers being broken so um it's this navig and and maybe lastly i just want to say what we've seen is people trying to intuitively navigate between different spaces um, at institutional level, at systems level, um, spaces where they are comfortable, uh, protocols, best practices, uh, spaces that uh, they realize um, are complex and they need different tools to deal with and then spaces that are even chaotic. So that navigation and applying the, the necessary tools is something that we've observed as well um, locally. Um, thanks, back to you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, Bruno, now the lab has often been involved in a lot of innovation projects at the heart of the Portuguese government. Uh, how have you seen the change in, in innovation in the crisis? Has it been easier or, or harder? Well, in, in fact, as uh, previously said, it is, it, it is quite an ambiguous um, situation. And if you can present my, my, my slides, I, I, I will try to easily convey this, this message. Well, from one side, we see that the crisis has solved the problem of the Gordian knot. You, you have to answer hands on and you, you, have, you have to do things working. And in that case, for innovation, it was a huge occasion for practicing what we are preaching for a lot of time. And I think it is important because it shows that it's not only a matter of having available solutions, it's a matter of putting them into practice and acting over it. And uh, in, in that sense, it was a magnifying lens that shows the potential that innovation has in bringing value and not only interesting uh, proposals. In a, in a second place, I really think that something interesting that the crisis has, has shown is that the innovation ecosystem is something real and not only a uh, theoretical hypothesis. There is indeed some sometimes latent, sometimes invisible connections that uh, could act as a way of transference between stakeholders that are engaged in providing, for instance, better public services being them related with the community of entrepreneurs, with the scientific community, or with the public administration itself. It, are, these links are active and they can, they can in fact create this kind of sharing economies where uh, logics like crowdsourcing or skills transference are real and are really happening in a very uh, fast pace. And that, that is interesting because I think it's a, a second confirmatory uh, value. And finally, I really think one important enabler, it's uh, the, the open uh, government approach. And more than ever, it is important to face the challenge that is being placed in the relationship of trust and transparency and reliability. And to, 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 to put something that Edwin uh, has said in the beginning, I think it was a huge occasion to show that the public governance is critical because uh, the state has not deserted. It, it, it keeps working. It has overcome some of, of its critical uh, challenges and providing um, a, a very powerful 
reaction in, 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 in Portugal. It was really critical, especially for not magnifying inequalities. I, I really think Len has, has, has said something very important. Crisis try tends to uh, sometimes to um, uh, magnify some previously existing inequalities. And that is quite important. For instance, in, in a country in, like Portugal, where last year 20% of the population don't have, don't access the internet, they were, they were not, let's say, uh, included in, in terms of digital um, participation. It is important that the digitization of public services don't mean that these uh, people get uh, doubly penalized by, by this movement. And at the same time, we, we see that the crisis, you, you can change for the, for the next slide, please. Yeah, we, we can see that th there are some crossways and they are, um, they are uh, not completely solved at the moment. From one side, of course, information is critical in, this, in these times. We, we have mentioned that the role that scientific knowledge and reliable information has played in, in giving very powerful uh, responses. But uh, we are dealing with the plutoric, dispersed, and sometimes unreliable quantity of information being constantly issued and circulating in social media, but also, of course, in, a, in, a, in, in, in other channels. And it is really important that we, we tackle this problem. And it is a problem that we have, we have faced um, in, our, in our work. How can we create a very um, coherent answer to this challenge? Then there are also a, a risk. It, it's, it's a kind of logical reaction when we are facing something unknown, something so huge as this pandemic, is that sometimes the very voluntaristic uh, reaction to solve the problem creates disuse, rushed, or atomized, dispersed uh, initiatives that try that sometimes replicate themselves without dialoguing or we, without without taking that into consideration. So. The coordination of these of these efforts is is critical to to continue to provide a very good public uh, answer to this to this crisis. And and finally, there are specific challenges created by this virtualization of the public service. From one side, the remote work for for our teams is for 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 the teams of public servants was was something very interesting because it showed it is it is important to work that way. I think all the colleagues have already mentioned that, but the remote work has also created some, some issues. For instance, we have conducted in our network of innovators, we have conducted a survey, and um, there are of course some, some issues related with the loneliness, for instance, that sometimes appears in this, in, this, in this context. And that is a very specific problem that we try to tackle, for instance, in our uh, collaborative work plan. And for the other side, we have this digitization of public services that can, of course, create uh, new trouble. So it, it is not a kind of uh, silver bullet for, for all the problems. It helps a lot to contain the, the, um, the biggest problems that this kind of crisis could bring if people continue to go to the, to the, to the um, offline public services, but at the same time, don't solve all, all the problems and it creates new demands. Uh, to, 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 to take back something I have said, if you have problems in, uh, uh, um, if you have previous problems, you cannot um, create uh, or aggravate that problems with the digitization. So any kind of uh, movement in that sense should also, should also take into consideration that is not a matter of just technology. It's also a matter of use of technology and to access to that, to that very technology. And for, for us, that, that was, that there are two very important crossways. And to summarize, yes, I don't have a kind of um, uh, very um, homogeneous answer to, to give, but in fact, this situation appeals to very contradictory dynamics. And that is the, capac the capacity that we have to navigate between these uh, seal and derivatives that can give you um, the answer after the crisis. Thank you. Um, now, if one of my colleagues could bring up the, the poll results from the previous thing. Um, I think as we've heard, yes, there's been quite a, mm. yes, it is indeed easier for some things and, and harder for others. Um, the next bit that I'd, I'd like to just quickly explore is uh, this question of the different types of innovation that we're seeing. Um, 
we're seeing that innovative responses are varied in all sorts of ways, whether it be scale or whether it be um, the degree of, of innovation. Um, one lens that we think is useful to, to think about this is uh, that of our innovation facets model, where we can think about innovation in, in four broad sort of categories of activity. Uh, the adaptive, which is about adjusting to the context and lever um, such as digital delivery. There's the enhancement oriented, which uh, in this instance might be around bolstering existing suppliers or leveraging existing solutions. The mission oriented, which uh, such as the cities of uh, Milan and, and Paris have started uh, in using this crisis as an excuse to, uh, or as justification to help accelerate the um, removal of traffic in key parts of their own cities. And there's anticipatory innovation, which can be harder to see and to tell, because if it's done well, you don't necessarily notice it. Um, but we can look to the countries affected by SARS the last time, uh, which may have been helped uh, prepare them better for this time. I think what we can safely say, and, and from what we've heard, is that there's been a lot of activity in the in the adaptive space and in the enhancement oriented space and slowly I think we're starting to see more and more in the mission oriented space as uh, agencies and governments start to get to grips with this and, and see how it can fit uh, how how their missions can uh, be enhanced um, by the the opportunity of everything being shaken up but that's just uh, my view um, I'll throw to, I'll ask my colleagues to open the next poll. Um, and then uh, just going to our panelists very, very quickly noting, uh, I want to give a lot of time for our participants to ask some questions of their own. Um, in a crisis, we know it can be hard to focus on anything beyond the immediate, uh, but governments have to operate across those different time frames that Edwin mentioned at the beginning, uh, the immediate, the recovery, and the longer term. Uh, Pierre, do you have any thoughts about how innovative activity fits across these, how governments can support innovative activity for existing, evolving, and emerging needs at the same time, especially during a crisis when the demand and the attention is on the right now? Um, I think, Alex, the, what the crisis have done is uh, two things, well, two of many things. Um, one is that we realize that the normal planning processes are not sufficient to deal with these crises that will get more and become more and more. Uh, so we realize we can't return to pre-COVID and therefore we need to build a new, reimagine uh, what the public service and the country and the economy should look like. So what we've seen is that many officials intuitively almost grab to a scenario approach, uh, short term, uh, medium and long term. and, and uh, quite a lot of debate about what is short term uh, in this context um, and uh, what is long term in this context. But um, the scenario approach allows then for us to, to start building those futures and then bring in anticipatory governance and at the anticipatory innovation into the, um, into the fray. The other issue that has happened as well is the issue of revalue of certain services, revalue of what we had um, uh, and thought was important for us. And um, that is now reframing, for example, healthcare and what we should be doing and what is possible now. Um, we had trouble between uh, tension between public sector and private sector healthcare. Suddenly the crisis has removed those tensions and now we can rethink a national health strategy. So definitely what the crisis has done positively was to allow us to reimagine what is post-COVID. There's not enough effort because, as everyone has mentioned, that we are looking at a crisis mode and dealing with the short term. Um, but we slowly see some movement towards thinking beyond um, and all government clusters has already said what is what are the long-term plans as well uh, so I'm very positive about looking at the future and the way that the response would be we have a risk adjustment strategy uh, phasing down from five phase five down to phase zero um, and each of those steps will help us reimagine and reapply uh, some of the lessons into the future 
Thanks, Alex. Thank you. So, Lene, uh, how do you think um, that transition between the different speeds and the different the innovation thinking about the different uh, scenario well horizons can be managed? Mm. Um, I'm going to try to share my presentation again. Um, just waiting for the computer to wake up here. Yeah. So I've been. Um, I think it does, uh, your question is one well, depends on how we understand government. What level of government? What point of view of on government are we making? And uh, I think probably as not as a surprise to you at least, Alex, I've chosen the decentral perspective <laughs> uh, because this is also where we know that innovation thrives in Denmark. So this is my current thoughts on timeframes, and it's just at the pen to paper point at the moment. So I hope you will bear with me for that. So I think right now I'm working with, we divide the timeframes into four sections. So the first one is the emerging crisis. This is where we focus on sort of the traditional health and safety preparation, where the, the health authorities, the epidemiologists and everybody is involved in that. And, um, and then at least in Denmark, the politicians were involved as well in the lockdown. Um, you make a decision to lock down to, in whichever strict form of it at one point. Um, and that's when, at least in Denmark, it really hit us that we were in crisis mode. In Denmark, the lockdown was announced on Wednesday evening, we were, we were uh, that the, the public sector uh, employees were to work from home and so on. And on a Monday, I would not have predicted that happening on a Wednesday. So I think that's when it really hit us that, that we were in a crisis mode. Um, I, think, I think the crisis mode has at least two parts to it. Initially, it's all of these innovative health and societal solutions, but also in this really high degree of crisis mode with the centralized decisions as well. And then at some point during the crisis, in Denmark, it looks like the lockdown is going to be about two months. You start living with the crisis, you know, having these kind of webinars, the digital meetings, it becomes every day. Um, trying to figure out, it becomes every day. There, there comes a, a sort of everyday living to it as well. Then we're seeing a, a shift in faces again with the opening and we're moving into some sort of a post-crisis world where we will adapt and change and return to something where we're trying to figure out what part of the new normal and the old normal will figure into this. And then I think at some point we'll have something that I don't know what is <laughs> that will signal that we are in a new reality. And I think if, you, if this works as a, as a framework, then we can have some discussions with, for example, the frontline workers and the innovators out there. And then we can start asking them about these different phases and be kind of like, what did they experience? What did they do? What was your main focus in this, that, or the other time frame? What was easy? What was difficult in that specific time frame? What surprised you within that time frame? What did, who did you collaborate with mostly in that time frame? And, and what was your main priority? Because if we start sort of having some discussions about analyzing this, and because I think somebody asked in a chat or in a question somewhere as well, how do we capture all this? And I think we need to work with both qualitative and quantitative measures at the moment, because some of this is so new, we can't do a survey. That's, that's my thinking on it. And if we start talking about it like this, then I think we can start working with scenarios in a very basic way, basically. Because then we can have the gray line is sort of what I imagine happening, right? In the emerging crisis, everything was pretty much normal, old normal. Then during the crisis, we have new normal. And then with the opening, we need to figure out with everything that's been happening, what do we, where, do we want, where, where does it make sense to end up? Will some of it be in a new normal? Will some of it be sort of in between? And will some of it be old normal? And trying to play around with what kind of scenarios do we see? What, what makes actual sense? And also, I think it's a very interesting discussion. That's why I put the question mark there. I don't know what signals moving from post-crisis into a new reality. And I think it will be really interesting to see what happens. Um, I saw a Boston Consulting Group, they estimate that we will be in this post-crisis period between nine and 24 months. And then what comes after that? I think that's one way where I wanna, I wanna try to see if this, <laughs> if this way of thinking uh, about what happened and what we can learn from it will, um, will do something for us. So I'm gonna test this out with some of our network in, in the weeks to come, but this is one way of approaching it at least. Thank you. Um, now to you, Bruno. Um, uh, what's your view on, on how to manage these multiple speeds of, of innovation? Yeah, I, I try, I try, I try to, to map some of the things that right now are not right. So uh, if, you can, if you can present the slide, please, yeah. So, um, First of all, uh, of course, 
we are in, in a, at least in the in a initial phase, people were hijacked by urgency. So it, it was necessary to provide very in a very fast uh, track solutions to put people at home working and at, from remote uh, contexts. It was necessary to provide very quick answers. But of course, that creates a kind of tunnel effect. So people are so concentrated in solving very pragmatically and thank, well, fortunately, in a very successful way as well. But people tend to ignore other things that are occurring at the same time. For instance, Mariana Mazzucato has very recently published a paper that says, for instance, that other crises are not delayed or not postponed because of this uh, pandemic. So at the same time, we, we need to try to counteract this presentism tendency that the crisis places over us. So it is very nice to have this very pragmatic, very quick answer. It was great. We, we probably will have to keep that uh, skill operating for, for the next months, but, but it is important to try to enlarge our horizon and to try to make a solution sustainable and uh, more regular in their ways of, of working because in state of emergency, uh, it's very difficult to keep all people, for instance, mobilized or to demand the very, the very, the, the very same degree of, of attention. A second thing I really think it's in, curious to see, it's a kind of nostalgia of normality. So there are people say, well, the world that we have lost, um, so the, and, and I can understand that, but at the same time, remember that we are trying to change that very normal. So we are, we are searching for a new normal before the crisis. So we don't want to return to the normal as we know it. We, we really need to build a new normal, not because of the crisis, but because the crisis make more urgent than ever that this new normal became in fact something different and better than the previous time. Then the third path, I really think it's, uh, it's not right. It's uh, as happens in all the kind of millineristic moments, we have this scaremongering that try to convert everything in a kind of blame game. So who is to blame for, for whatever? And this is very dangerous because it places the discussion uh, in a level where sometimes rational arguments don't, do not simply stick. And it is, it is really important to take that into consideration, not only in the, let's say in this negative side, but also because we see some people with a kind of wishful thinking that look at the crisis at, the moment that we are waiting for solving all the problems and that kind of magical reasoning is not going to work. So we are keeping committing errors. We are keeping to do things that are not exactly working uh, at first very well. So we need in fact to uh, think for instance in, in rehabilitating all these kind of experimental approach to innovation that help us to provide very quick answers but very secure answers at the same time to, 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 to control these kind of things. And finally, there are sometimes uh, uh, this discussion, I think it's an important discussion. The expertise uh, gives us the chance for having medical and technological solutions. They were very powerful, but they are not a substitute for public debate. And uh, of course, there are measures that have to be taken in a very fast pace, but it is important to engage every, everyone, every citizen, every stakeholder in the process of making uh, the innovation the new normal. Otherwise, it will be an innovative environment that probably won't take into consideration uh, the, the, the importance of a diversity of points of view. And that, that is uh, relevant. At the same time, I can, I can see if you can show the, the next slide, please, very easily. There are interesting ways of futurizing. So we can right now, in this very moment, start working to, const to build together the new normal. And one of the things is stop guessing what the new normal will be. And we, we, we have this way of using evidence-based decision-making processes. We can, we can, of course, triangulate between qualitative and quantitative data, more complex or more thin data, but it is important that we really try to, to grasp the huge amounts of data that, and data don't speak for itself. We need to systematize and analyze that data, of course. So th that's a very important point I want to make. Then, it was nice to see all this innovation ecosystem to engage in providing answers. So right now, uh, as members of the public administration, we should reinvest in the innovation ecosystem. So we should keep this uh, transfer going on and we should not, well, say, well, thank you very much. We we'll see in a while or something like that. We, we need to keep this bidirectional transit working 
and be because it was important uh, the collaboration that we get and the other thing that is really important that there's a lot of things being done there's a, there's plenty of solutions there's a huge amount of solutions the question is not about output is all is about the actual use of output there are good things that won't be used at all and we should look at that and try to understand why because the sustainability of these solutions is important is not is not um, is not uh, solving a problem for all for forever to have a, a certain app the app needs to work and if it didn't work we should we should face that and try to understand why it didn't work and when we create something it can solve a problem for now for a couple of months but then we need to think about its management about how, how can we keep it working in the future and it is really important because it it will it will provide solutions they are user centered and that they are they are also oriented to the inclusion and uh, that, there's a other other thing i think it's important and i really think we have not explored um, in enough measure is that we need to do a uh, responsible innovation to innovate is to think about its consequences there are things we can anticipate there are things that we desire but there are also things we cannot anticipate and things we we don't desire that will happen and the use of foresight of anticipatory methodologies is a, a little bit like ops is trying to do it's quite important and it's a usual in, in opportunity to disseminate that and finally experiment doing innovation is doing experimentation is to test is to fail of course is to learn with that is to improve and it's a, a good way to reduce the margin of risk before implementing huge solutions and when people are pressed they try sometimes to make very pressed uh, decisions and experimentation can help even if it is a very small intervention to control that risk so that that's all i have to say to the, to, about this issue so thank you thank you um a lot to think about there uh, i'll call up the the next the answer to the the last poll um what, what did we see in terms of the mix of activity so as we might have expect a, a lot of adaptive innovation going on at the moment as people are responding to this change context and as we've talked about that will likely shift and evolve over time it's just a question of uh, knowing when is the right time to shift at the moment because we don't know whether the crisis is finished um i think uh, i did have some other points i wanted to cover but i think we need to give justice to our participants and give some time to some questions um which this has not quite worked as i'd hoped uh, uh sorry well, alex i can figure out uh, how to get you the questions in another there was a question about uh surveillance and uh privacy it's one of the first questions that was asked and how to balance uh, balance that in all of the response. Do you want us to just shoot? Or? Yeah, who wants to jump in there? Um, I think the discussion is just starting in Denmark now in terms of um, the government wants to develop a, a tracking app and um and now they lately they've involved uh, the council we have for data ethics so i think um even though denmark uh, we in denmark we traditionally have a high uh, level of trust in government and we have so many registries and are registered so many ways i think uh, um this is different to people so there's been a lot of criticism of some of the ideas in uh, in the government app that it would automatically bluetooth track people and the data would be sent to government and there's been a uh, criticism of that so it's it's definitely a discussion, but it's a discussion that's only happening now, and we haven't done that much tracing digitally in terms of of who it is. So it's a very important discussion to have now because this can go really, really wrong otherwise. Yeah, I can add a couple of uh, comments on that very, very easily. It's uh, I think it's a discussion that is taking place in all over the the the, the world. Well. Um, in portugal there's a discussion there's a proposal su suggestion from uh, from the community uh, but uh, it is voluntary so uh, it, it it is the citizen itself that can engage voluntarily in uh, in downloading that app that enables to do that kind of tracking 
But regarding this issue, I want to say uh, two things. One of the things it's uh, the fact that any kind of this kind of, of this innovation should take place in a well, using public debate and people should be aware, completely aware of what is the uses of the data, what is it is important or not uh, for having that data. So it is it is a very important discussion. It should be public, of course. And the second point I want to make is that sometimes we should think previously what is how useful it is to have some some kinds of solutions if it is really critical or not uh, because sometimes these discussions about the specific innovation could impair a lot of other very good things that are being done that don't receive the same attention because people get concentrated in something and sometimes we will discover that this innovation is not especially relevant so it's uh, and, and it's a kind of very generic comment but i, I think it's Something we should say. Another question that was raised was uh, how can we make sure that the improvements in government management will be kept after this crisis? How can we make sure we don't uh, fall back to defaults? Do you think that's a risk? Uh, yeah, would you like to tell us that? Definitely. Um, I think if we look at government as a system, it will default. Uh, back to the old ways of doing things if we don't identify uh, let me use the uh, the abused term of tipping points uh, if we don't identify where the tipping points are and how do we push it into a new um, state where there can be some kind of stability uh, it's going to default back uh, what i have noticed is that it gave us the opportunity to reevaluate values. And if we can use values as the basis of driving the change in system, um, it also helped in many countries, including ours, uh, to build new trust in government. Uh, and if we can use that again, uh, maybe lastly, uh, government need to understand that we need to move from a command and control to a much more socially active way of managing the outcomes. And we may have a long tail uh, to deal with. And, and if government can successfully do that, it can also successfully change the system and the public administration system uh, for, for good. Uh, but it's not going to be an automatic change. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's definitely a, a, a there's a risk that it will just default back to old normal. I think that, I think there's a lot of different things at different levels that need to be done in order not <laughs> that we don't do that. And I think so. For first point, there's a matter of timing. I think there is a there's a timing. The timing is good right now. I mean, it's within the last week that I've really had the conversations with a lot of different parts of the government system about. What is the new reality we're looking into? I think right now we're at sort of at the tail end of the really crazy crisis. So people are starting to have the space and the, and the, the room in their minds to even discuss this. So I think this is, this is a time right now to have these discussions. It's not in six months. It's, it, well, it's also in six months, but it's right now. Um, and I think I've heard some very specific examples of what the, what's happening out there. Like one, I spoke to a, a, a leader, she runs a, a public library. And she's been telling her, she told her staff in her virtual meeting, things are not gonna go back to the way we used to. You're not gonna go back and you're used to looking six months ahead and you schedule some activities and so on. We're not gonna do this. We're gonna go back and we're gonna, we're gonna go out and we're gonna talk to our users and ask them, what do they want us to do? So that's one way of, for, of, for the leaders, the innovative leaders to, um, to sort of push towards a sustained change is to involve the users and design thinking as someone mentioned in the chat is a really good tool for that. I think we need lots of different tools for it. But that's another thing that needs to be happening. And we need to connect the different, the different sort of points in the system that want to have these learning discussions. We need to speak up about one, making it legitimate to have these discussions and question what, what can we learn and what needs to change. And that should be legitimate to ask. And I think also one person working in a municipality told me that what he does is he takes, he takes really high <laughs> notes. So all the good examples he's seeing of what people are doing, like using digital meetings and all of a sudden, hey, the technology works and so on. And you don't spend that much time in your car and so on. He is emphasizing those stories, sort of the cracks in the old normal and how the new normal is looking out at you. He's emphasizing the stories about the new normal in the system. He's writing them down. He's, he's pushing them up the management chain. 
So there is a lot of different things we need to do in order to enhance a new normal. Um, Bruno, just building on this question, uh, another part was also around uh, what what has this revealed about people's yeah. the public servants' ability to to innovate and to I guess as if public servants develop these skills more, it'll be harder to return to to default. Um, do you see that this crisis has been a sort of intense training ground for innovation in some ways for public servants? Yeah, just, just, just thank you for the for the question. It's a very important question. Just just to just to uh, capture some some of the things that were said about the sustainability of the innovation. Well, the first is there are, there are a lot of innovations that have an expiration date, and that's not that's not bad in itself. So there's a lot of things that are being very innovative to answer this crisis, and hopefully they will expire very soon. So that's that's normal that that happens. Uh, a, second, a second thing I want to say is that a good way to try to make sustainable the innovations is to socialize the innovation. So if, if they are accessible, if they are spread, if they show their functioning uh, in terms of efficiency, they will become more uh, endurable so in, the, in the long term. Because there's a lot of contact points and uh, where, where it takes support for, for the future. So that's my recommendation. Regarding your, your question, if you, if you don't mind, I really think that the, the crisis, it's a, it's a training ground. It's a, it's a combat ground, but it's a training ground in, for, for innovation. So if, if you can uh, present my last slide, I, I will like to, to present it very easily. Um, so, um, the crisis, it's a, huge, it's a huge laboratory. It's a huge opportunity for uh, not only testing new things and see how they can answer to these very pressing uh, demands. It's a good way of improving and customizing solutions in order to be user-centered because we need to answer right now to these needs. But it is also left for the previous normal or the old normal as Lynn has, has told. So it's an, a test of effort that is being placed upon the old normal public administration. So the crisis is a lab and in a lab, we do not only experimentation as a kind of gratuitous exercise, but we do experimentation to learn to improve and to have tangible, better uh, public services. So in this sense, I, I really think it is, uh, it is important to, to look, at, to look uh, through this, to this screen because it is a catalyst and an accelerator of a paradigm shift. Uh, if we can speak about the bureaucratic revolution being uh, incubated, we really need to see that this is only possible because previously there were a huge uh, and a very long silent and gradual accumulation of small changes. We were only capable of answering this because we have accumulated, we have this very long and sometimes uh, very odd accumulation of innovation. So, it was uh, an occasion to demonstrate its value, but the, it was only possible because we continue to do, even if sometimes the results were not uh, inspirational before, we, 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 we continue the struggle. And this will stick for the future as well. So there's a lot of things that will disappear, of good things that will disappear, and we should keep doing the same, accumulating, trying, sharing experiences because Hopefully not, but if we have another uh, occasion, like this occasion, we hope sometimes they are not negative, they are positive changes. So if we have that occasion, that accumulation, that silent, that latent accumulation of innovation will, will flourish in that, in that very moment. And th that is really important to take. For me, it was a kind of uh, demonstration that doing sometimes innovation uh, was important even if in, the, in that moment when the project ended we don't uh, see immediate results uh, we have now the opportunity to, to, to show that value and finally and in a sense, in a sense it's also related with the thing of making um, sustainable the change um, a German sociologist Atmut Rosa speaks about this collective resonance that people uh, feel during the crisis so people get really attuned to each other. So we, we, have, we have faced incredible experiences of resonance between citizens, but also between public servants. It was, it was really very impressive to see the capacity of, of people to engage 
in their in their in their works in their front lines because there are people for instance that have to keep working while the crisis was was eating hard in all the all the all the all the world so it, it it was very inspiring but at the same time we need to make it something more uh, regular and for that it is important to engage that people their their experiences in making that not only a kind of collective experience and transitory moment but also to try to think about the model we are adopting in our public administrations and trying to think about this idea of a participatory state where for instance the collaboration like the one i have mentioned in the collaborative work plan for public administration it's a new normal so it is taking place not only as a reaction but it becomes part of the of the new normality and i really think it's something we are trying to do here and uh, it, it is important to make it uh, not only a, a very um, resonant moment but also an endurable uh, solution thank you Alex, you're muted. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, uh, Bruno. There's one question uh, here for you, Pierre. Um, in terms of uh, where do you see the, the South African innovation system moving in the future, uh, building off of this, uh, building on from the response to this crisis and how it might be impacted by it? Uh, thanks, Alex. That's a trick question. Um, I think, as we are saying, the world should not be the same. I don't think public sector innovation should be the same after COVID either. Um, what we have, there are positives that I think we should keep. Um, I think it was in 2017 um, that in an interview with Center for Public Impact, I said, we can't tell a medical doctor how to innovate, but we can create an environment where they can innovate. And for the last three years, we've actually invested quite a lot in our medical staff. Um, now I'm very thankful for that, uh, that we've invested in the ability of professionals to innovate. So at individual level, I think we should keep on doing what we are doing, and that is create the capacity and the environment for uh, experts to innovate within their field, but to learn from other fields. So what I've seen is that institutions are extremely slow in responding. Um, and that is an area that we need to strengthen, is how to create an institutional environment. Um, in your determinants model, the issue of parity is an important issue at systems level. Uh, this crisis had brought, has brought innovation to the level of parity with other conversations. Even, I think it's probably a, a one of the top uh, items. We must use that. Uh, to have a systems-wide rethink of how innovation is working so that we refocus on institutional capability. It links back to your previous question. Uh, we can't keep on planning in the same way that we are planning as organizations or institutions and expect innovation to happen. So uh, on that, those levels, we need to uh, do more advocacy of how do we bring innovation on par with all the other priorities of government. Back to you. Thank you. Um, we've only got a little bit of time left, so I'm going to uh, start to wrap up with a question for each of you in terms of um, what one thing has the crisis taught you or emphasised for you about public sector innovation? What's your, your soundbite takeaway for, for the audience? Uh, start with you, Lene. I'll just, um, I'll just share a picture. For that i'll be really quick i promise oh shit now it's gone back into that i think this is this is my one takeaway is that we're looking into a really interesting time to come because we need to find i think some of you guys were a little bit the this is partly going back to the uh, questions we just had about new and old normal we need to balance between these three in the future because there are definitely some people who are looking forward to things going back to normal and assume that's going to happen. Personally, I think they will be disappointed, but we need to take them seriously and we need to include this perspective when we move forward. I think others have experienced some pretty neat proof of concepts or prototypes of new ways of working, new solutions. They might not think of them as prototypes or proof of concepts, but I think they are and they want to keep them. So let's get those on board. And then there are others, this is the last balance we need to do as well, which is, which I'm including myself in that, 
this is a window of opportunity. This is the once in a lifetime opportunity to change the system, to do the paradigm shift, to do everything. Let's go, go, go. And I, so I think my takeaway is that this is not over yet and it will be a while before we even can consider it to be over. So how do we over a longer period of time make room for dialogue and activities that enable us to strike the right balance between these three perspectives? Because I think that will be a very long, very ongoing uh, issue that we need to do, not only at individual level, but at workplace level, also at society level. Um, so I think that's, that's my takeaway from the crisis is that it's not over and it's the beginning of something new. And I'm really excited about figuring out what that something new is. Thank you. Bruno, what's the, the one quick thing that you would leave our audience with? Well, I, I really think that um, the public administration has shown um, extraordinary capacity of adapting, at least, and adapting and providing answers to very, in, in, well, uh, unprecedented uh, challenges that were being placed over it. And, uh, I really think it's not really a surprise for, for the ones who really know that public administration is better than its reputation sometimes uh, for, for publicly available. But it, it was quite um, a very um, demonstrative moment for, for having democratic and uh, um, inclusive uh, public administrations working and providing um, very innovative solutions or at least keeping working will they very, let's say, Bethic services uh, during this, this, this crisis. And I really think it's, um, it's, it's important to keep that in mind because I really think, as Len has mentioned, that we are now facing the most uh, strenuous moment, but there are a lot of consequences that are occurring. And uh, some of them, for instance, the social impact that this crisis can have over employment, for instance, that they're, they are waiting for us and they are waiting for our creative and innovative solutions. And returning, even, even me, I, I really think the perspective of line is, is interesting to have this, uh, taking into consideration this diversity of approaches. We really, we really need to figure out a way of connecting all these different perspectives in a, in a continuous engagement to solve not only the immediate problems, but the problems that are being created. Because even if we, in terms of health issues solve the problem of the, of the pandemic, we still have a lot of problems to solve. And uh, that right now, it's a, my, my main takeaways. This is uh, just taking place and we should not um, think about the, the work as just limited to this, to, this, to this moment. So it sounds like we've got two people on the scooter heading to change the whole system. Pierre, would you also put yourself on the scooter? Um, yes. Um, I don't think there will be a new normal. So I'm going to steal from Harvard Business Review uh, in terms of my tidbit uh, for a takeaway. Uh, less innovation theater, less sticky notes, less post-its, and more dirty hands. I think that's what labs need to do and that's what all of us need to do uh, so that we practice how to innovate in all sorts of crises, the climate change crisis being the, the most important one. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, talking of uh, getting hands dirty, um, I'd like to just share a couple of things that, that our audience can start getting their hands dirty on. Um, so as mentioned, we have the innovative response tracker where you can upload uh, the exam innovative examples from your jurisdiction. Um, this helps us get a sense of what's going on as you've heard today. Um, and it will inform our research and, and uh, enrich the discussions we have between countries. Uh, secondly, uh, we have a couple of other upcoming webinars that uh, you should uh, take the advantage of, um, including looking at exploring innovation portfolios and how to make those practical, and one later on around what is it, what's really involved in making innovative public sector organisations, what does that look like over a multi-year period, um, where we've got a, a case study from uh, an uh, interesting example from Australia. And thirdly, we have uh, a, something a bit different, an unconventional event for unconventional times that we're planning in November, 
which will be a global networked series of events um, hosted locally, obviously, uh, trying to look at these questions, um, that many of which we've talked about today, about you know, what do we need to leave behind? What do we want to hold on to and keep? And what do we need to do differently into the future? Um, we're hoping to explore that from the, both the bottom up, hearing from people on the ground, the front line, and also uh, using that in, to inform some leadership discussions around, well, how do we take this forward? How do we help change the system so it delivers better for all of us? Um, otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's event. Uh, I'd like to thank each of our presenters, Lene, Bruno and Pierre for participating and taking the time to, to share your experiences. Um, otherwise, thank you and that's all from us at the uh, Observatory of Public Sector Innovation for today. Thank you. <laughs>